we consider what God can do in and through us, we often restrict His ability to the confines of our own limitation. We measure God's willingness to use us in direct relation to our imperfections, assuming that without perfection we are not able to be used by Him. The truth is that because of God's grace, He is all the more willing to be involved in our life. Today, Corey Benjamin shares how the grace of God has helped him in the imperfections, concluding that doing anything of significance from ourselves in the kingdom of God is pointless unless we trust His favor and goodness to be demonstrated through us, especially as we are in the process of becoming more Christ-like. We pray that you will be encouraged as you listen to the third message in our series, Stand, Living a Life of Grace. Well, thank you. Can you guys hear me? All right. My mom told me when I was about five that I would be very, very persuasive. Um, (laughs) And it it hasn't let me down in my life, uh, working in sales at different times and being a business owner. Sometimes those skills do come in quite handy. So um, awkward silence. It's really funny that you brought that up. So if you guys are silent, it's going to get awkward. So um, I remember playing with a good friend of mine, Christian Steingart, on some Sunday mornings and Saturday nights, and he was the king of creating that awkward silence. He would stop at the end of a song and he would just stand there, much like I'm doing right now. And it really can get odd. And I'm not talking for five seconds. I'm talking for like a minute. And we would just stand there and he would just be off in another place. And I'm, I'm looking there and I'm just like, get me out of here, right? Anyways, awkward silence. There's a couple things I learned this morning. Number one, I'm no longer a young adult. I cannot attend the event. <laughs> it's not very inclusive of you guys. Um, but I am 40, so I can't attend. And number two, my goodness, you girls, I just loved worshiping with you this morning, and it gives me such delight. And, and yeah, give them a round of applause. Come on. What's so encouraging about that is that, you know, we've, we've carried the weight of music around here for a long time long time. I've been singing at Jubilee since I was 18, so 22 years. I started at Livewire when we were under the tower singing with, you know, Eric Bozeman and those guys back in the day and Lisa Jacobs and and the whole crew. And uh, throughout the years, there have been so many people that have come and gone. And and sometimes that weight can get, it can get heavy when you're leading 52 Sundays a year. And that was kind of where a few of us lived. So I'm so excited uh, to see you up here. And you did an amazing job this morning. And not for one second did I feel like, oh my gosh, you know, where are we going? So church, we are in good hands when you see these young ladies taking us into the presence of God. Yes. So thank you. Short intro, Corey Benjamin, as you all heard, I have a wife. We've been married for almost 19 years. Uh, We've got two girls, 14 and 13. And uh, I grew up in Montreal and I wasn't, uh, I wasn't a Christian. I grew up in a predominantly Jewish home, particularly on the holidays, so my dad didn't have to go to work and I didn't have to go to school. And um, <laughs> yeah, at, uh, at 13 years old, um, I had entered into probably uh, what I would call the darkest spot in my life. And you're, you know, I've been alive for 40 years, but I still draw on what I went through in that time of my life. Uh, I was very alone. My dad was doing his own thing. He was pursuing um, anything and everything that didn't relate to me and raising me. Uh, I was left alone uh, to do my own thing. I I had to go out and get a job delivering newspapers at about 11 uh, years old, and uh, that was so that I could eat and so that I could uh, help pay the rent because he lost his job when I was around 11, and I'm I'm not exaggerating. He laid on the couch uh, for about six months in the same sweatpants and and long sleeve t-shirt. I don't know if any of you remember the brand Varney, but... From back in 1987, that was a big popular brand, but I can still see him on that couch laying there day after day. I'd get up in the morning, I'd go deliver my papers, I'd go to school, and I'd come home, and there he was again. I was like, Dad, are are you going to move? And um, I promised myself that I would never, ever, ever go back to where that situation was. I, I just, I despise that part of my life. I don't share too much about that part of my life, but I tell you what, it helps me say grounded and focused and centered on who I am. Uh, Because uh, in that time frame, I didn't just deliver newspapers as I shared with you guys a a couple months ago. I did have an interest in cars, and uh, I did like to take cars that weren't mine. 
And, um, <laughs> and it, was, it, was, it was a good gig. You know, you could make a little bit of money in an evening. Uh, another thing popular back then in, in the, the early hip-hop years was the, you know, the Mercedes-Benz symbols. So I'd be out on a Friday night and Saturday night in the uh, very, very affluent neighborhoods, breaking these things off and, and selling them at school for, you know, 50 to 100 bucks. And uh, I had a lot of a lot of things going on. I, I, had a lot of, I was making a lot of money by the time I was 13, but I had no choice. I felt, I felt trapped. All of a sudden, my mom gets this call. So as, a, as I said, my parents, my parents split up at a very young age, and um, my mom was living in Toronto. She was pursuing a completely different life than the one I was living with my biological father in Montreal. And um, mom gets saved. I shared that one Christmas a couple years ago, and mom remarried, and they had two kids. And um, I went there at Christmas time in 1989. And, uh, you know, of course, everything at my mom's house was so different. You know, Christmas was a big thing, whereas growing up in a Jewish home, that was not a big thing at all. We didn't deal with that at all. So I, I got there in 1989, and I'm sitting there in the living room. It's, you know, a couple of days before New Year's Eve, and mom says, you seem, you seem off. And I was like, well, you know, I, I've, I'm at the end. And she's like, what are, you, what are you talking about? You're 13. And I was like, well, you know, I, I just got kicked out of school. Um, and uh, there's a lot of guys that are looking for me. And uh, they probably want to probably kill me. And uh, she's like, well, what, are you, what are you talking about? I said, well, I had this thing going on at school. And I got, I got caught. And I, I upset a lot of people. And, uh, and I just ended up with a, with a broken wrist and uh, a couple of punches in the face. And, you know, I got, I got out of it. But nonetheless, I said, I... I can't go back there. Uh, there's no way for me to go back without, without meeting, meeting my maker. And uh, so she's like, well, you know, I'll talk to your stepdad about this. And uh, New Year's Eve, 1989, my parents, um, I'll call them my parents now, we'll move away from biological dad. My parents always had a big New Year's Eve thing. My mom would put on an amazing, amazing dinner. I mean, like we're talking a big, nice prime rib roast. 30 guests would come over, and we would eat and eat and eat, and it was just, it was awesome. I'm getting extremely hungry thinking about it. <laughs> and, um, but what was so cool is the 28 other people that they would invite were these Christian guys, and I had never, ever been exposed to this. I, I could actually string a sentence together with using just the F word, using it as a noun, as an adjective, as a proverb, you know, <laughs> adverb, um, not a proverb, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, I had never, ever, ever been exposed to anything like this in my life. And um, I'm standing there and I'm, I'm, you know, it's 1989, hip hop's a huge, huge part of my life. And I'm, I'm that white kid that wished he was a black kid. And... Um, <laughs> I've got, my, I've got my Jordans on, I've got my jeans with my pants sagging down and my big, big t-shirt, and uh, these, two, these two black guys walk in, and uh, they're from Detroit, Michigan, and one of them was uh, Alonzo, and the other one was Mansfield, and uh, Mansfield and Alonzo were two really, really cool guys, and uh, Alonzo was a huge basketball fan, and we just sat and we spoke for like two hours about the Detroit Pistons and the Chicago Bulls, which were the two best teams in the league at the time. And we talked and we talked and we talked, and he slowly spun the conversation to where we started to talk about God. And it was an amazing conversation. That night, during, you know, right around midnight, where they were praying in the New Year, I could just feel this, I didn't know what it was, this emotion come over me while they had the keyboard in there, somebody was leading worship. And I could just feel, I could feel the Holy Spirit as I know what it is now. But it just began to just pour over me, like I'm talking like bucket after bucket after bucket, and to a point where I was just crying uncontrollably. And I had, I had come to the end, you know, and I'm, I'm glad it happened when I was younger. And in that moment, the other gentleman, Mansfield Samples, about six foot seven, black guy picks me up, and right then and there, uh, I accepted the Lord. And um, my life changed right then and there, but it wasn't like, you know, snap of a fingers, everything was over. Um, that's when I began to really start to walk in a direction where, you know, I, I should have been walking because I, I could see, and, and it's, a, it's a great marker for me because if I ever look back, I can see what was there. So I don't ever want to go back there. Do you know what I'm saying? 
you know what I mean? You ever get through a situation and, and you look back and you're like, man, I, I don't know how I got through that, but I know that I'm not going to go back to that, right? And what I'm going to talk about this morning is grace, because for me, that is how I got through these things, once I began to understand it. And when Dave approached me, I think back in February or March about speaking, I, I love playing up here. I've always got my guitar or I'm singing. There's no intimidation whatsoever. Uh, at the drop of a hat, I could pick up a guitar and just come and sing with you guys. It doesn't bother me. But this, I had to sit down and really think about it, really think about it, because I didn't want to get up here and, and not take this opportunity to communicate something to you that's amazing. I want you to take 10, 15 seconds, and I want you to think of a time in your life where you were like, man, if it wasn't for the grace of God, where would I be? Just take, take a few seconds and just think back to a time. That could be today, that could be yesterday, could be 10 years ago. Think about it for a second. For me, it's really easy. I just shared a lot of it with you. And um, grace is an incredible gift. It's an incredible, incredible gift. Um, you know, naturally speaking, when we go to a birthday party, uh, you're going to bring a gift, typically speaking, you know, for kids mostly, you know, not necessarily when we have an adult party. But how much thought goes into, oh my goodness, like what am I going to bring? What am I going to buy? How much is this going to cost, right? By the way, it's my birthday on Thursday. I do accept all forms of gifts, uh, and I, anything will do. But uh, my first slide here for you guys is grace. Whew, that worked excellent. Is a free gift. It is a free gift. Let's read what Romans 6.23 says. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. All right, so... How do we get this free gift? And, and, and is it truly free? Well, yes, it's free to us, but there had to be a price paid, right? I went to Starbucks this morning, and I whipped out my, my iPhone, and I paid my, with my app, and I redeemed my free gift. But after I finished my drink, I have to buy the next one. It's a terrible deal. But the next sixty two fifty that I spend, I'll get another free drink. Isn't that an amazing deal? It's terrible. It's awful. But what this says is it means that we cannot earn it. It's free. So it doesn't matter how good I am, it's still there because it is a free gift. Now, we understand that it's a free gift at this point in time, but when you start to think about it, what did Jesus have to do to get us to the point where we can feel and experience this free gift? What did he do? Does anybody want to throw out, shout it out? He died, exactly. So in essence, between the Father and the Son, that's not a free gift. That was a sacrifice, a debt that was there that had to be paid. So Jesus paid that debt for, for us so that we could experience this free gift. Now, can you think about this for a second? Last weekend was, was Easter Sunday. And think about the two viewpoints. Think about God the Father and God the Son can you imagine the conversation that they had with each other when Jesus communicated to God the Father that I am going to sacrifice my life? Now, I'm a dad, and I know a lot of you in here probably are parents as well, and if you're not, you may not completely understand where I'm going with this, but you will one day, I promise you. I remember taking Megan to the hospital one time. She was uh, thinking she was superwoman, and she had her hands on the, on the chair, and her feet on the couch, and the chair collapsed, and I mean, her face just went smack right dab into our hardwood floor, not into the carpet, and she busted her face open, and she, she was bleeding, and mom was screaming hysterically, and it was, it was quite a scene. So we picked ourselves up, we collected ourselves, we got some gauze on her face, and we took her to the hospital. So Megan asked for me to go into the room with her, with the doctor, and I'm sitting there all the while, all I'm thinking is, man, I would switch places with her. Do you know what I mean? I would just, I, no problem, break my arm, my leg, stab me in the side, whatever. I would just switch places with her. And, and she's sitting there and she's calm. I mean, Meg's a, Meg's a solid girl. She's strong and uh, she's not sitting there bawling, but I can tell she's in pain. She's biting her, biting her lip and the doctor comes out with this, 
big needle. And I'm just looking at that and I'm like, maybe I need to get out of here because I'm going to pass out. But I'm serious. It looked like it was a quarter inch wide. It wasn't, but (laughs) it was really big. And all of a sudden I could see the fear in her eyes because they weren't just going to give her this needle in the arm. They're going to give her the needle in her lip. Yeah. And he looked at me and he's like, you might not want to watch this. And I was just like, in that moment, man, I would have done anything, anything to just switch places with her. Can you imagine? I can only imagine that's what God the Father was thinking when God the Son was, was there. You, know what, do you, do you get what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Let's jump into the next, uh, the next point here. I've got five points for you guys this morning. So, Grace is received by faith. Say that again. Grace is received by faith. Let, faith. Let's read these, uh, these slides here. There's the exact little click. For it is grace, sorry, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And it is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Let's read that again. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's nothing that I can do. Nothing. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that you cannot boast. So it's not like, hey, I led worship every Sunday for the last 52 weeks and I'm amazing and God loves me more than all of you guys. No, it is equal. It is available to you. It is available to you. It is available to the person that doesn't do anything in the church. It's okay. I'm not condemning you or making fun of you, but you should volunteer. (laughs) Romans 4.16 says, we can receive God's promise by having Faith. So there's a common denominator here. If I have faith, I can receive his gift. It's, it's kind of like a, an all or nothing. Do you know what I mean? You got to be all in on it. You cannot just kind of be like, you know, one foot in the warm side and one foot on the cold side, just kind of hedging your play. Am I going to, I don't want to do this today, you know, but oh my goodness, I, I'm in a bad spot here. I need God. So I'm going to step over and step out. No, no, you got to be all in can't be half. can't be 50-50. you got to be all in. you got to put your trust in the Lord and have that faith. And you know what's so cool about faith is you cannot figure this out with your intellect. There is no scientific explanation for, for this. You know, sometimes we ask the kids after church, where would you go, like to go for lunch? And it's a common conversation. And sometimes this conversation can turn into a fight. And then mom and dad go home, drop the kids off, and we go out for lunch. True story. Multiple times. (laughs) But, you know, we will make a suggestion of a place that we want to go, and the girls have never been there. I don't want to go there. Why not? I don't like it. Well, how do you know that? I just know. I don't don't like the name of it. (laughs) You've never been there. How do you know what they have? Fine, let's go. Well, then, this, then mom and dad are like, no, we're leaving. Or, or like, hey, I, I love to travel. I love to travel. We've taken the kids all over the world. But sometimes it's, you know, like, would you like to go here? No. Well, why not? Well, I just don't want to go there. Well, but why? Like, you've never been there. You don't even know. And that's where it comes. You have to have faith. You have to have faith that mom and dad are going to take you to a restaurant that you can find something to eat. You are very lucky that you are getting an opportunity to travel somewhere that is not Canada. Do you know what I'm saying? Let's keep going here. Grace is available to everyone. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that so cool? You think back to the previous slide, it's, it's not a matter of how much work I do, right? It's available to everyone. So what does that mean? That means we, church folk here... We should be bringing everyone in. Should we not? You know what I'm saying? We should be bringing everyone in because this church is not created for, as Dave put it earlier, the seasoned people or as Jocelyn did, whichever. This church is created here for us to come in and bring people in, in any shape, size, form, clothing, whether you wear a thousand dollar suit or you come in your sweatpants, homeboy. I love you, George. (laughs) For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And what I love about this being open to everyone is it literally is everyone. You know, I think about in John 8, 
the, at the, the Mount of Olives where the Pharisees were trying to kind of manipulate and trick Jesus in by bringing in this woman who was caught in adultery, right? And they were trying to manipulate him to see how he was going to react. And they were like, you know, under the law of Moses, we should, we should stone her to death. And, and, and Jesus just, you know, simply lifts his head up and he's like, okay, let's do it. But whoever doesn't have any sin in their life, you throw the first stone. Okay. So all of a sudden, he, he, looks over, he picks his head back up, and there's nobody there. So he looks at the adulterer, and he says, so, so where are these people that were condemning you? Who condemned you? Who said this? She's like, well, actually, no one. Nobody said anything. They're actually gone. And he looks at her, and he says, go and sin no more. So everyone. Did you see how quick that happened? It wasn't like a... This is a 10-step program. Step number one is admitting that you have a problem. Step number two, like, come on. It was that quick and that easy. So if you're here this morning, you may not be an adulterer. You may not be dealing with the same thing she was, but you may be dealing with whatever it is that you have as a mountain. But Jesus is saying to you this morning, go. Go and sin no more. Isn't that amazing, church? Yes. Grace is available only through Christ. It is not sold at any store. You cannot, as we've said a couple times, you cannot do anything to earn it. It is unmerited favor. You haven't done anything to deserve it, but it's been bought and paid for. For the law was given through Moses. So the law, we follow the law naturally, right? And I was driving my daughter to a ball game. We were a few minutes late and I got a ticket. It was 150 bucks, and I was very happy to see the guy in his tight pants and tall boots. And, uh, but that was the law, right? I broke the law. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth come through Jesus Christ. Many people have received God's gift of life by grace of the one man, Jesus Christ. Let's keep rolling here. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to me. Sorry, no one comes to the Father except through me. And last but not least, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. It only comes through Christ. Are you feeling stuck? Are you feeling like maybe you're not worthy of this grace? Are you feeling like you need to be perfect to do things in God's kingdom? Because you are looking at a very, very imperfect person right in front of you today. You're listening to me. You don't have to have your stuff together 100% church. You don't. I'm telling you that. and And I've struggled with that. I've often wondered, God, why do you choose to use me? Now, I'm not a, I'm not a murderer. Be realistic. But you know what? I have sin in my life. And you know what? It separates me from God. And then I have this overwhelming guilt when I have to come and, and get up on stage and lead worship. And I'm just sitting there and I'm like, man, you know, my heart's not in the right spot. But God still moves. Ministry still happens in spite of those things. Why? Because I understand that grace only comes through Christ. Only. Todd, can I, is Todd still here? Did he take off? Todd, can I get you to come up and hit some keys for me, man? So if you're feeling stuck, I want to encourage you that you don't have to have it all together to, to get there. You know what I'm saying? Church, are you with me? Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm as real as they get. I, I, I'm a straight shooter and I don't like to put any facade out there. I, I don't like drama at all. I'm as real as they come. And I want to tell you that there are things in my life that separate me from God, but in spite of those things, God still continues to use me. Grace is extended throughout eternity. John 3.16, one of probably the most well-known verses in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only, his one and only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So if grace is extended throughout eternity, that means that that's for my past sins. That's for the sin that I have going on inside of me right now. 
and that's for what's going to happen tomorrow and in the future. So it's not a, it's not a get out of jail card free at all. But grace should change your motivation. It should change how you think, how you approach a situation. When you're driving down the road and somebody cuts you off, it's really easy to want to whip out back in front of them and lock up your brakes, give them the finger, swear, whatever you may do. But grace changes your motivation. It conditions your heart. You know what? It's like, it's like a miracle that starts to take place inside, isn't it, church? And it begins to change the way you think. Like I said, it, it doesn't let you off the hook, though. It doesn't mean that you can just continually do these things over and over and over, as Paul says in, in Romans 6, until grace abounds. In theory, it, works. it does work that way. You could continue doing things, but if you truly understand the grace of God, it should be changing you. I love this. Paul is saying here, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not. But what I hate to do, I do. That's me right there. And I'm sure there's many other of you, if you guys were to seriously get real and honest with yourselves. But what's so cool is in Titus 2. I love this. I love this so much. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no. To ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. What a different world that we are living in today. You know, when I was growing up, when I was 13, I didn't have the internet. The accessibility to take you right off the path is so, my gosh. You know, I love my girls, and I, I, I'll do everything I can to protect them. There's so much more coming at them today than when I was a kid. So much more. Parents have a tough job. So what do we have to do, church? We have to teach our kids, our family members, and ourselves the discipline to understand that it's only through Christ and it's extended throughout eternity so that we condition ourselves to say no. Say it with me. Say no. That is the true definition of grace as that change starts to take place in your life. Can you imagine how effective we would be as a, as a church, as a, as a body, if we actually learned to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled? If you actually stepped back from a situation for a second when you're having a debate or an argument with somebody and put yourselves in their shoes rather than just... I'm fast with my tongue, very fast. And I've learned how to take, put a little sandpaper on there to take that edge off. But it's something that I have to, to deal with because I'm, I'm already down the street when I'm in my conversation with somebody and they're just getting in the car. And it's tough on me sometimes, right? So it teaches me self-control. And for me, this sums it up right here. So what's the definition of grace? Well, when what you need to do becomes what you want to do. If you're here this morning and you're stuck, could I get the prayer team to come up? If you're here this morning and you're stuck and you're feeling, I can't get to that next place. I, I'm here to tell you, you can. And you will. If we look back over these five points, it's a free gift. It's not subject to. There's no terms and conditions laid out at the bottom of the page. You don't need to pay your debt in 30 days. It's been paid. It can be received by faith. Step out, open your eyes, and be like, you know what? I'm going to. I'm going to be like Peter. I'm not going to look at the waves and the water but I'm going to look and focus my eyes and my sights on Jesus, and I'm going to step out. It is available to everyone, wherever you're at today. 
Grace only comes through Christ and it is extended throughout eternity. So if you're here this morning and you would like the team to pray, I feel the worship team did an amazing job creating an atmosphere for me to walk up here and be super calm and deliver this word to you this morning. So thank you guys again. And if you're here this morning and you would like some prayer, don't be afraid to step out. Just do it. Just do it. Look, don't look back. Just look forward. Like I said earlier, it's for past, present, and future sin. So let's, let's, let's receive that grace here this morning. I'll give you guys a moment. If you're here, please come.